And we are recording. Well, Merry Christmas and welcome to Cedar Bluff Baptist Church this morning. Wow, we are in COVID mode again. <clears throat> there are always many people who are here in spirit, they tell me. But today, if anybody's here, it's in spirit. <clears throat> kind of a, a lonely um, day for a Christmas service, but praise God, it's going to be okay. We keep going, we keep trusting our Lord Jesus, and uh, you know, this life is always a challenge, always plenty of things to uh, find ourselves getting worried about. People worry about the disease, COVID-19, and they worry about the vaccine now. I mean, if you're going to worry about it, you've got to figure out which one, one you're going to worry about. You can't worry about both. Someone said, regarding the vaccine, so you've been eating chicken McNuggets and hot dogs all your life, and you're worried about what is in this vaccine. Hmm, interesting uh, comment there. <clears throat> You know, we talked about the three wise men, and we, we, we discussed a couple weeks ago that we don't know there were three. There may have been more or less, but uh, here's something that Bonnie found. Three wise women. If it had been three wise women, they would have asked directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stables, made a casserole, brought practical gifts, and there would be peace on earth. <clears throat> I guess there's some, some truth to that, no doubt. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we want to turn our faces heavenward, <clears throat> turn our faces to you. Uh, Lord, we need you, as we always do. I thank you, Lord, that you came. That you uh, came the way you were supposed to come, when you were supposed to come, when the fullness of time had come. God sent you into the world, Lord Jesus. Your Father sent you to come as a little baby and come in the most humble and really a poverty situation. That was your choice. That's how it was supposed to be. And it was supposed to be in Bethlehem. And it was foretold 700 years before it happened that it was going to be in Bethlehem. And so it was in Bethlehem. And those involved in the train of events that brought this young couple to Bethlehem that night um, had no idea what they were doing, but you were using even those who had nothing to do with you, as you do today. So we don't have to be worried about whether you have control. Everything is going right on schedule. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you're coming again, and you're going to come again right on schedule. In the meantime, <clears throat> we ask you to bless all those that are at home, hopefully tuning in this morning. We pray that you would keep us well, that you would heal those who are sick. <clears throat> Angie and Roger, from our faithful number, have been diagnosed as positive for COVID-19, but they have been doing quite well, and uh, Lord, I pray that it will continue to, and that no one else would get this disease, that vaccines would, would work and would be uh, safe, and that you would get us through this particular challenging time. Uh, Lord, take this service that we're seeking to spread out through the live service on Facebook and, and through the recorded service on YouTube that will be available. Lord, we just pray that you'll use it. Use us just as you would in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now Bonnie's got the candles. I think yes. she's lighting the last one. Yeah, here we go. Make us a full candelabra. Well, yeah, we're full candle. Okay, so the first Sunday we lit prophet's candle, which represented hope for the Messiah. And the second Sunday, we lit Bethlehem's candle, which some people say represents peace, and some say represents faith, and so we got a little confusion there. It's all good. Okay. The 
it's all good. So we did peace and faith on this that day. And then last Sunday we lit the candle of joy, which everybody says that one of his joy. So we're good. Yeah, we're good now. Now this Sunday we let we light the angels' candles. So we're seeing a lot of angel calls. Uh, and some people say this one represents peace, and others say it represents love. So we have peace and love, we have peace twice. Yeah, so. <laughs> Make sure we got peace on earth, good will toward me. And then, because this is the last Sunday before actual Christmas Day, for the day that Jesus, the day that we celebrate that Jesus was born, for everybody's birthday, we're going to light a place. The Christ candle, which is the white candle in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Okay, so now we have all the candles of the. Beautiful. And peace. Angels and peace today. <laughs> That's going to be the theme of our songs today, okay? Yes, yes, oh, right. and by the way, uh, I, just, I said this before 10 o'clock, but now that it's after 10 o'clock, we're uh, live. If those of you who are watching live on the uh, feed on our page, if you, know, if you just put a little comment like hi, just to let us know that you were there, we can't answer you right now, obviously. Because um, it's just the two of us here, and but if you would um, kindly just let us know you there, just say yes. hi. That's all we need to know. So later we can look and see who all watched live just for fun. Okay. And if so, any of you are here in spirit, come on up and help us. Yeah, come on and help us sing. <coughs> all right, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Mm. I'm gonna sing some songs about angels. Y'all sing along at home. It'll be great. <laughs>
Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, the actual birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 20, but I'm going to start out with a very familiar verse, the whole passage is familiar, but verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Lord, thank you and praise you. And bring forth what you have brought forth this morning. The old, old story, which is the best and truest story that's ever been told. Lord God, have mercy on us all and help us to be useful to you in the lives of so many others who need to respond favorably to this story. In Jesus' name, amen. There is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Mary and Joseph were in Nazareth. They were married. She is called his betrothed wife. <clears throat> the marriage, of course, hadn't been consummated yet. But the fact is they're married and they're in Nazareth and, and they're rolling along and she's expecting and she's pretty far along in that expectation. <clears throat> and uh, they hear about something that wasn't really good news. They hear that the Roman government was requiring that everybody go back to their ancestral town, <clears throat> wherever that might be, and register for the purpose of taxation. <clears throat> uh, Caesar Augustus wanted to make sure that he got every dime that he could possibly get out of people. Now this is bad news at best, but with her nine months pregnant, it being a long trip, <clears throat> it would take a while, they would be there for a while, and we find out later that they're still there probably a, a year or more later. So he had to close his business, and a huge tax bill was on the horizon. So none of these things were very exciting all by themselves. Um, this account to me boils down, uh, one way we could look at it would be to boil it down to three kinds of people. Number one, the people who think they are God. Number two, the person who is God, Jesus Christ. And number three, the people who choose the right person as God. First of all, the people who think they are God, and particularly we are thinking about Caesar Augustus here. Caesar Augustus was uh, the emperor of Rome at this time, and he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. Now, interestingly enough, there's some family connection um, to Julius Caesar between these two gentlemen, but um, even though Augustus was adopted uh, by Julius Caesar, he wasn't adopted by him until Julius Caesar was dead. That's kind of weird, <clears throat> but in Julius Caesar's will, he officially and formally adopted <clears throat> Gaius Octavius, who becomes Caesar Augustus, and gives him succession to the throne. So here we have Gaius Octavius, and you would think that his uh, name as Caesar would be Caesar Octavius. But instead, it was Augustus, because Augustus means majesty, and it means deity. And so what Augustus was saying was, I am Caesar God. He was claiming to be God. He thought he was God. He was going to be greater than any of the other Caesars. He was powerful. He was great. He did a lot of amazing things uh, in his time as a, uh, an emperor. But uh, he was very arrogant, very self-centered. And he was asking people. No, he wasn't asking people. He was commanding people. To go back to their ancestral community, no matter where it was, no matter how long it took them, no matter how difficult it was, 
You know, for many of, of our Cedar Bluff folks, uh, their ancestral community is Cedar Bluff. So you wouldn't have to go anyplace at all. And Bonnie lives on Highway 50 in Columbus, uh, Steams area, and she was raised most of her life um, on that same road. So it wouldn't be too bad for her, but for me, I'd have to go 1,500 miles. And I hope I wouldn't have to walk it on a, a ride a donkey. Can you imagine how long that would take? At any rate, I don't think I don't think anybody had to go quite that far, but it, it, he didn't care. He didn't. It didn't matter to him uh, how far it was, how much of a financial burden was, how old you were, how sick you were, how pregnant you were. It didn't make any difference. It's like our friend Kenny, who's a retired pastor in South Carolina, <laughs> likes to say whenever you're talking about somebody who is uh, very demanding and and demanding things that are unreasonable. He said, they don't care. They don't care. And uh, Caesar Augustus, he didn't care. He didn't care. He didn't care about the people. He didn't care how much it hurt them. He didn't care how difficult it was. He just didn't care because he thought he was God. <laughs> and as Caesar, he could do as far as human things were concerned, anything he wanted to. If he wanted to kill you, he said, kill you. It was okay. Put you in prison, put you in prison. Take all of your possessions, take all of your possessions. I mean, it didn't matter. He was all powerful in the sense of this world and this life as long as God saw fit to allow him to be there. Interestingly enough, Mary and Joseph submitted to his authority, though it made their lives miserable, they submitted to him. And Romans 13 says that we, there's no power, no authority, except that which God ordains. And so, uh, yes, we need to go against it if it goes directly against God in some particular feature. But in this case, uh, the requirement to go back to your community, your ancestral community, and be registered was not against God's word. Being taxed by the government was not against God's word. Uh, God would deal with all the excesses and all of these things eventually. But for now, Mary and Joseph submitted. They didn't whine. They didn't cry. They simply did what they had to do. So we see people who think they're God. And you probably know some of them. Secondly, the person who is God, Jesus Christ. The person who is God is about to become incarnate in the flesh, is about to be born into the world, <clears throat> having been miraculously conceived and now being brought into the world in what we would consider to be kind of strange circumstances. Mary and Joseph's interest was in the son of the highest that had been promised uh, to be born of Mary, and that was all that was on their mind. If you look at verses 4 through 7, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her delivery. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Mary and Joseph focused on what the angel had said, focused on God's will being done. But I imagine it was very difficult for them. It probably had gotten to the point where with all the things that were happening and all the miserable, difficult situations they were finding themselves in, they were probably wondering did we really hear from an angel? Was there really an angel? Is there some mistake here? Would God have his only begotten son born into the world and his earthly guardians being going through all this? I mean, you think God would make it as nice and plush? We think a lot of things. As human beings, they probably thought a number of things. That weren't true also. I, <clears throat> but um, God knew they were the right folks and that they would do what had to be done. 
Even though it seemed hopeless, helpless, and hapless. <clears throat> I like that word, hapless. You know, hapless means unfortunate, unlucky, luckless, out of luck, ill-fated, jinxed, cursed, doomed, unhappy, forlorn, wretched, miserable, we'll be gone. And, and maybe you have felt like your circumstances were pretty much hapless at times, but that doesn't mean that God isn't involved. It doesn't mean that they're not going to work out right because God is, he never leaves you nor forsakes you. As his child, it's going to be okay. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And Mary and Joseph were in the midst of his pur purpose and in the center of his purpose. And so all of the difficulties, problems, troubles that they were going through are not to be thought of as confusing or any big problem. God is in charge. He's working all out. And these things had to be part of it. The trip, the pregnancy, they had no help. We don't see anybody helping them. You would think that angels would be crowded around them and helping them. You would think that God would have people who were believers in God helping them and being there for them. Apparently not. We don't, we don't see it. We don't see any of it. Okay, on top of everything else, they arrived late. <laughs> we have some folks in our church that are known for arriving late. Um, but we always have room for them. But there was no room for baby Jesus to be born. There's no room in the inn or in any of the inns that might have been in town. So as we know, they ended up in a stable. They ended up probably in a cave that was used as a stable for <clears throat> animals to be kept in. So this was a dark and dingy place. Um, animals were no doubt there. Uh, manure was there. <laughs> Dust was there. Dirt was there. But you know, I can imagine Mary making the best of it. And she's kind of sweeping up and whatever way she can, with some hay or straw. Uh, she's trying to clean things up and tidy things up. <clears throat> and as she's doing that, suddenly, oh! I don't really know what a contraction feels like. <clears throat> and I'm not wanting to find out. Um, Bonnie says any of these guys that want to become women need to have to have a baby as part of it. It would be only fair, wouldn't it? Anyway, <clears throat> so uh, now, oh Lord, not now, not here, not in a cave, not in a stable, not with a bunch of animals. What is going on, Lord? Why? We often ask why. We often wonder why. We wonder why about all this COVID mess. We wonder why on Christmas we have to preach to an empty building because we're trying to uh, help people not get sick. But God knows. And he worked it out with Mary and Joseph and he's going to work it out with us. But I'm sure they wondered why. However, they pressed on by faith. They did what they had to do. <laughs> really, verse 7 if you think about it, it's probably a very lonely verse because we don't see Joseph in this part of the passage. We, we uh, Either he was sitting over to the side and he didn't know what to do, and so he was just like, duh. <clears throat> I mean, having a baby is rough, especially on the man. Oh, I'm just kidding, 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 kidding. <clears throat> I thought it was especially rough on me when we had our first, and... Uh, Bonnie had natural childbirth, not because we really wanted to, but we couldn't afford anything better. <clears throat> and um, she was so brave, she didn't even scream or cry. Other women were, ah, but not her. She's tough. But anyhow, that night, I mean, like, I, 
I watched that whole thing. Poor me, you know. And, and the, I didn't know what was going on. I thought they were killing her. And then they had to use forceps on Jason. And, and it was just one of those. I couldn't go to sleep that night. My mother-in-law gave me a Darvon. It didn't even put me to sleep. I was in a shape. So it's kind of rough on a man too. But I'm sure it was rough around Mary. Poor Mary is probably, he may, she may have been by herself because Joseph may have gone out looking for a midwife. I mean, if it had been me, I'd gone out looking for a midwife. We, we have a, a couple that visited us uh, a short while ago that we, we knew this couple, um, what, close to 40 years ago or about 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And hadn't seen them since, I guess. But they came to visit us, actually visited us at the parsonage over here. And uh, it was great to see them again. But that particular couple had about 10 kids, and, and the husband delivered them all at home. Not me, Charlie Brown. Uh-uh. No, thank you. But old Chuck, poor Rose. <laughs> That's a girl's name. Oh my. Anyway, so Mary had a lot to complain about if she was one to complain, but she did not. She pressed on by faith. They pressed on by faith. She was maybe 14 years old, having her first baby. He, he met, Joseph may have been gone out to look for a midwife. She may have been all by herself in a cave with animals in a strange town having her first baby at age 14 by herself. That's a picture for you. <clears throat> and she had the baby and she wrapped him in swaddling cloths. It says clothes, probably better cloths. Anyway, um, take a piece of material and put the child on it diagonally and wrap them over and then take strips of bandage type material and wrap it around to keep it on the child. And that's pretty much how they dressed a baby until they were about uh, one year old. And uh, so kept on going, pressing forward, doing what they had to do because they had a higher purpose the angel said, this was the Son of God. This was the Messiah they had been waiting for all through the centuries. So there's greater purpose here than their little troubles and their little problems and their little pains and their little disappointments. A much greater purpose was being worked out and we need to realize, and it's so hard for us to get a grip on it and really hold on to it, but we need to realize that the purpose that the Lord has in our lives is more important than our little problems in this world and our comfort. Don't we all have difficulty yielding to that? So the people who think they are God and the person who is God, Jesus Christ, and the people who choose the right person as God. Unfortunately, most people choose Caesar. They choose money and power, a worldly empire. <clears throat> I mean, think of it. If you, if you or I today suddenly had the power and the authority to do anything we wanted to do, probably ruin us. The old saying is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And most people, uh, when they get anywhere near that kind of power, they don't do too well with it. <clears throat> most people ch would choose Caesar. They choose that power. What if you could own the world? What if you could be the dictator of the world? What you, the Antichrist is going to be the dictator of the world. Of course, Jesus will be in the right way because it is his world and he made it. <clears throat> but if you could be dictator of the world, I, you know, nobody else would want to live in it. <laughs> and, 
And uh, if I were a dictator of the world, nobody else would want to live in it. But how many people would choose the world and all that is in it? Jesus said that it, what's a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what shall he give in exchange for his soul? He said there's something more important than what Caesar had. A whole lot more important. And you know, the humble shepherds understood that. They chose the baby. They chose the Passover lamb. Interestingly enough, the shepherds that kept the flocks around Bethlehem were primarily keeping potential Passover lambs. And uh, so their business was to keep these Passover lambs so that they could be slaughtered at Passover. And now they have been introduced by the angel, probably Michael, many think, introduced by the angel to the Passover lamb and told where he would be born. And they get to go. And they're excited. And I, I believe they were already true believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because I don't believe that they would have had this magnificent revelation uh, of the angels standing before them, the glory of the Lord, and then all the other heavenly beings uh, praising God. This was, and, and to be told, the sign of the baby in the manger. Um, they didn't ask for directions. They didn't ask for uh, an address, a GPS, nothing. Uh, they probably went to every manger in town until they, every stable and every manger until they found one with a baby in it. Probably was only one with a baby in it. I would imagine. And uh, these shepherds chose the baby. Um, already, already believers, no doubt. Now there were in the same country, verse 8, shepherds living in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Uh, shepherds were lowly folks <coughs> in the social system. They, they were usually defiled and couldn't go into the temple because uh, they were dirty, they had blood on them from cutting themselves accidentally, or, uh, the animals, uh, excrement, blood, whatever. I mean, it was just a mess and that they weren't well thought of. They were pretty much the lowest of the low, uh, other than maybe lepers or something. Um, <clears throat> but they were believers and they were seeking God and they were seeking Jesus. Verse 15, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go, let us now go to Bethlehem to see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Uh, they didn't wait a moment. They didn't wait until sun up. They went then. So they sought him. And when they got there, they came with haste. They were hurrying. They found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now I've often pictured this verse as Mary and Joseph and a baby in a feed trough together. But that's not what it says. We have to have the comma, <coughs> Mary and Joseph, and the baby in the manger. Now when they had seen him, so they sought him, let us go now. <clears throat> they had seen him, they saw him, uh, and then they spoke of him, they made it widely known, saying uh, the saying which was told them concerning this child, and all those who heard, what did all those that heard the shepherds how did they respond? How would they respond? How do you think they would respond? Well, these were low, they were low on the social status level, and therefore uh, nobody would have listened to a word they said, or that's what we 
would think, but all those who heard him in verse 18 marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. There's something that we often forget, and that is that God works with everybody at the same time. And if he's working on you, and he has told you that you need to go and talk to another person about Christ, and you need to um, get into a relationship of some kind with uh, this family down the road, or these people across the road um, for Christ, then God is also able to make those people open and responsive. And of course he has to do that, or it's not going to be uh, very fruitful. But we've got to believe that. Even if it seems totally impossible, uh, God specializes in things that are impossible. And the fact is, people did listen to the shepherds even though normally they wouldn't pay much attention to them. In verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God all for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. So the shepherds, they sought him, they saw him, they celebrated him, they spoke of him. And that's what we should do. And it must have been very encouraging to Mary and Joseph you know, they'd been through the difficulties that they had been through. The darkness of the circumstances had closed in on them and tried to snuff out their, their hope and their faith. But, you know, when those kind of things are coming in on us, heaven breaks through. Somehow or another, heaven breaks through. And heaven broke through for them through the shepherds. I mean, suddenly these shepherds come in and they say, yeah, the angels told us about you. All right, there he is. Wow, what a confirmation to Mary and Joseph that, okay, we didn't take a wrong turn. We did the right thing. We're where we're supposed to be and the baby has been born and he's what the angels said he would be. Amen and amen. Old Caesar Augustus was large and in charge. But you know what? God thinks of large and in charge folks. He sits up in heaven and laughs at them. Psalm 2, 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in duration. You don't have to worry about them. Augustus was acclaimed as giving Pax Romana, peace to the world. But we know that real peace only comes through Christ. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace of the heart. Most of all, the peace with God. <clears throat> Sinners are at odds with God. We were the enemies of God. We'd chosen to be. Through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. God sent his son to save. He's the Savior. Jesus means Savior. He's Emmanuel. He is God with us. God came to become a man and become part of this mass. Not a part of it in the sense that he sinned or did anything wrong, but part of it in the sense that he had to walk these dusty roads and he had to put up with rejection and ultimately torture and death in order to do what had to be done. That little baby. <clears throat> Sometimes we, I think, perhaps, are too idealized, idyllic in our representation of the birth of Jesus. If we look at the cold hard facts, it was really difficult. But Joseph and Mary believed and were ready to do whatever they had to do. And they did. And the shepherds were common people. But they believed. And they rejoiced. Mary and Joseph accepted God's plan as well worth the trouble. All things do work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. 
Let us submit to his purpose like they did. Mary and Joseph and the shepherds chose the right person as their king, as their Lord, as their God. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God the Son, sent by God the Father, filled with the Holy Spirit. They chose the right king. They chose the king of kings. My question to you this morning is, how about you? Have you chosen him as they did? Where nothing was going to be allowed to stand in the way? I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. Oh, you can do it. It's just whether or not he's number one. That's our constant struggle. Whether we're number one or he's number one. Whether we worship some other God or the true and the living God. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads together. We're going to sing an invitation, and um, you can sing along with us, bow your head, whatever you feel led to do. What's that going to be? Just as I am. Just as I am. That's what I've got here. And it's always this way, just as you are without one plea, but that his blood was shed for you. service, um, don't forget to give your offering to the Lord, your tithes and offerings. Be faithful to Him regardless of COVID or anything else. Uh, you can send your offering to Miss Pat as you did before, um, Pat O'Brien as you did before when we were uh, meeting only online for a while. And if you have any questions about that, just let me know. Um, it was Monty uh, McElwain's birthday this week, and uh, Becky Barron's birthday this week. Uh, also, Roby and Linda had an anniversary this week, so <clears throat> I think you've heard enough of our singing today, but you can sing them a little birthday song if you'd like to. Now tonight online at 5 o'clock we'll finish up the Lord willing finish up John Bible study and um, then on Wednesday night at 6 we'll have our online prayer meeting. Yeah. And what we're going to do is uh, those who are coming in online I'm going to call you from my computer and FaceTime everybody who can FaceTime just like we did Wednesday night, we use FaceTime, and uh, not Facebook, but FaceTime. And then uh, those who do not have FaceTime, who don't have iPhones, we can call, we'll call you on the, on the actual, the phone phone. You okay. know, just, it, we won't be able to see you, but we'll, but we'll be able to hear you. So, like we did, Roger and Kay came in on the phone. We did a conference call. So now that we figured out. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> I'm going to start calling Bonnie Roxella. Okay. 
I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I just didn't want to clarify that. That's good. That. No, that's good. No. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, we're, we're a team. We're a team. It's like they were. Amen. All right. Let's, let's <laughs> dismiss in prayer. And as we do, um, our governor asked us to have special yes. prayer today for Mississippi. And uh, obviously dealing with, with the COVID-19 thing and getting people vaccinated and all that. And, uh, and pray, pray for Mississippi. Uh, he's, he's dedicated this day as a day of prayer and fasting. You can fast from food or some food or from uh, listening to your jabbing music or TV or whatever. Um, just spend some extra time today in prayer for Mississippi. I, I think it's great we've got a governor that would even want to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the fact that we could be together, even if it's only together uh, on the airwaves, as it were. But um, <clears throat> we pray for Mississippi. We pray for Mississippi, the people's health, and overcoming this COVID-19. We pray even more for their spiritual health, that we might have a revival of love for Jesus and of dedication and commitment to him and to his body, the church. Lord, we pray for Mississippi. We pray for Governor Reeves and all of the governmental officials, both state and local. We pray that this state would rise up, would turn back to the Bible, turn back to the God of the Bible, and that this state would again be the Bible belt and be the belt buckle and be used of God to turn the whole country back to you. We pray in Jesus' name. That's one off.